It's a great time to get away from cold weather up north and get down to your shirt sleeves and get some cactus in your knees. I know a lot of guys will go down on Christmas, they'll kill a buck on their 2020 tag, then they'll buy another tag and kill one after January 1st on their 2021 tag. So they'll kill two bucks in one trip. I got an in-reach message from him in Alaska and I said, hey dude, hope you're not mad, but I bought you a unit 18 tag. I can't help but encourage people who are starting to think about it to go ahead and acquire points. And Wyoming is an easy one to get. This is Jared Lyle here from the Hunt and Fool on the Wild Initiative podcast. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. I've been blessed to harvest 22 of the 29 North American animals with my bow. My personal 24-hour record for death threats is 88. They will start putting two and two together and realize this is how you call bulls in. So when I go hunting now, that's the ethos I take with me. You know, whatever whatever this hunt is going to throw at you, you pull your big girl pants up and you get on with it. Giant bucks are freaking awesome. They're beautiful. But you know what? I would not trade this first puck for anything in the world. So I'm really, I'm a geek. Magicians and dragons and magic swords. <laughs> I shit you not, man. I'm the biggest dork in the gun business. I'm Freddie Hartay, Hollywood Hunter. This is Aaron Snyder. Hey, this is Trevin Stoltzfus with Outback Outdoors. This is Rihanna Carey. Hi, this is John Sloan of the Interviews with the Haunting Masters. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey, all welcome to another episode of The Wild Initiative brought to you as part of the Waypoint Outdoor Collective. Y'all, again, we are back with Robert Hanneman and Jared Lyle of Hunt and Fool. Today, y'all, we are going to talk about one of the icons of Western hunting, the mule deer. Super excited to talk about this. Um, and really what we're planning on doing is going through every single state in super f- refined detail <laughs> about every possible place you can put in for mule deer and exactly what the odds are and Oh, wait, no, because that would be like six Joe Rogan length podcasts. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're we're going to sit down. We are going to talk about uh, just basically some good strategies. If you want to hunt mule deer consistently and get some good tags uh, after a few years, really get some uh, better success rate, tagging the trophy tags. We're going to talk through just some recommended strategies on this because there's a lot of places you can hunt mule deer out of state over the counter there's a lot of incredible opportunity and it would just be near impossible i think to cover all of this in any sort of reasonably length (laughs) reasonably uh timed podcast so guys uh, again thank you so much for uh hopping on with me today yeah thanks for having us yeah good time thank you so you know as we've been doing it you know you get a call at hunt and fool uh, as we know, Robert takes them all and Jared, you know, kind of <laughs> sits true. around. That's right for the glory. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so you you get a call and you're talking to someone and they're like, hey, you know, I'm just starting out. I want to I want to start start hunting mule deer. I want to do it. I want to do it regularly. But you know what? I want to draw. I want to be able to draw a, a really good tag one of these days. What how should I go about doing this? You know, the first question that I'm going to ask them is, you know, where do they live? And if they're in a state that has mule deer, then that's probably going to be the first place we're going to talk about because, A, it's going to be the least amount of travel for them, the least amount of expense, and, uh, you know, we can go from there. If they don't live in a state that has mule deer, then we just got to really start looking at what is it they want to do? Do they just want to experience their first mule deer hunt? Are they instantly trophy hunters and they want something giant and kind of just go down that direction. So in the perfect world, they're just going to be like, Hey, I, I just really want to experience hunting the West. You know, I've been a whitetail hunter my whole life. Even a little mule deer looks giant. I just mm-hmm. want to go experience a hunt. And uh, those are the, the favorite phone calls. You know, when a guy calls and says, I want a 220 incher, then those phone calls are not fun. But <laughs> um, when someone's just like, I just want to go shoot a nice mature deer, then, you know, that's one where we can have some fun with. So, you know, it, it really can come down to the time frames because a lot of states have different seasons. Um, so, you know, are they archery? Are they rifle? You know, what are they looking to do? How far are they coming from? What's closest? But uh, any of the Western states, like you mentioned, have healthy mule deer populations. And even into the Midwest, the Dakotas, you know, Nebraska, Kansas, Texas, you know, there's mule deer in those states as well. But for the most part, when we're thinking mule deer, we're thinking like the core West. And, you know, uh, a favorite state for me, for guys to have their first mule deer hunt 
is typically Montana. Montana has very easy to draw tags. Usually within two or three years, you'd be guaranteed a tag. Your first year, you usually have about a 50-50 draw odd. And they have a long season. You know, they got a five-week rifle season. They got a six-week archery season. So, you know, your timetable from usually early September through Thanksgiving, you can hunt deer. Most other states don't allow those late rut dates. We all know when animals are in the rut, they get stupid and it's easier to hunt. So Eastern Montana is a great place for guys to go have fun, see some deer, shoot one, have a self-sufficient hunt, maybe camp out, stay in a motel. Um, that's kind of where I'm going to send most guys for their first hunt. Cause it's like, we talked about antelope the other day, high success, seeing lots of animals. Eastern Montana is going to do that for you. If you start looking at other States, Wyoming, Idaho, you typically get into more October timeframe seasons. Same with some of the Utah general tags. And that's just a tougher time to hunt mule deer. You know, you think elk September, they're rutting crazy. Well, mule deer is November, they're rutting crazy. October is the tougher time frame to hunt those deer. Um, so Montana is kind of my go-to for just someone coming out and wanting to do a hunt, especially on a do-it-yourself hunt. Yeah, I would I would totally agree with that. Uh, again, if for no other reason than just the generous season dates, lots of public land, um, and it is more fun to chase deer around when they're rutting. And I don't know how much longer Montana will continue to do that. I keep asking myself that, and they keep sticking to their guns that they keep that season open five weeks through the rut. As long as they do, and with the with the number of tags that are available, I totally agree with Robert. It's a great first place to go or at least a top place to always keep in mind to come out and fill the freezer chasing some deer around. And of course your deer tag's good for whitetail or mule deer. And a lot of areas have a lot of overlap of both species. And I will say the one thing I did notice about Montana is you have to, and we discussed this in the, uh, the one of the last episodes as well. You have to make absolutely sure you know what you're allowed to shoot in each unit because it's not like some states where it's pretty much like, okay, you can shoot only bucks or you can shoot only do this or that or the other. It's with a lot of these tags. I remember you go from unit to unit and it's like, okay, this unit will allow you to shoot a white tail doe, but not a white tail buck. And it'll allow you to shoot both mule deer does and bucks, or you can go to this other state. And it's like, it's, it's always a mix. So just fair warning to everyone, regardless of the state you're in, but especially if you're hunting Montana, make absolutely sure you know exactly the regulations in the unit you're going to be hunting. Well, that's a good point because there's quite a few units, particularly in the western part of the state, that are you have to draw a permit to hunt a um, mule deer, whereas your general season deer tag is good for any whitetail that's that's open during that season. But the mule deer is permit only, and a lot of them are unlimited, meaning if you put in for it, you're going to get the permit, but then you can only hunt buck mule deer, antlered buck mule deer in that HD, that hunting district. So yeah, you definitely want to study the regs, uh, particularly as you get further west in Montana, it gets a little bit, bit more restricted, both in terms of t- hard to draw units and some of those unlimited units. And to touch on that real quick, when when we're stating unlimited units, that's for someone, there's two draws in Montana. There's a a general draw that takes place where you're going to get the deer combination license as a non-resident or as a resident, you buy them over the counter. Then the second draw, which takes place at essentially the same time, is for those special areas or those unlimited. So it's not like there's unlimited deer tags where you can just apply and be guaranteed a tag. You still have to beat the odds and draw that general tag first. That's something we break down in the Hunt and Fool magazine and on our website. Yeah, excellent point. And one of the cool things as well about Montana is, you know, we keep keep coming back to being wise with your applications, being wise with your dollars and finding out ways to spend it. And Montana can definitely be a pricier, pricier state. Uh, but you do get, like you said, you get those really long extended seasons. There's so much opportunity. And there's also the option for those, uh, those combo licenses, the, the deer and elk, I think they call them like sportsman's licenses. And they have various combo licenses where if you're, looking to put in some serious time hunting and you're going to be out in the woods. And I mean, how many times have you been on an elk hunt? You've seen mule deer, only mule deer. And how many times have you been on a mule deer hunt and all you're seeing is elk? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, if you're like me, you can get the combo tag and not see anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's an option for, I think it's a good option for if you want to hunt lots of stuff throughout the year, you know, it's an option to, 
a little more wisely spend your money, you can get that combo tag and uh, get a pretty long season for both. Yep. Yeah, Montana is really good about that. You know, you can get your deer elk combo. You can hunt both. If you buy the archery stamp, you get the six weeks of archery season. You know, and when guys are coming out to places, especially when you're going to be hunting elk, I always recommend picking up a wolf tag. You know, if you're in Idaho, Montana, they're relatively cheap, $50 in Montana, uh, cheaper than that in Idaho. Because if you're in the woods and you came upon one, you know, it's something that you'd regret not having the tag if you didn't get an opportunity to kill one. Um, Idaho does some very similar things you know when it comes to going into the woods maybe with just one tag but having multiple species you can hunt the cool thing there is if you buy a deer tag um, for a unit and i hope totally changed everything up this year you now have to pick your unit as a non-resident and a lot of them are already sold out at this time but this is one if you're on the ball december 1st you can typically get a tag and know you're going to hunt there and if you don't get a tag then look at applying for montana like we just talked about mm. but let's just say this year well, i do have a deer tag and uh, i'm going into unit 27 um, in idaho and if i happened upon a a wolf, a black bear, or a mountain lion, I could actually harvest that and put my deer tag on it. And the same thing goes if you had an elk tag. So even though I only have one tag, I can only put it on one animal. But because those other seasons are open at that same time frame, I'm in the woods looking for deer. But if I see any of those predators, you know, I can just kind of use my deer tag for that animal and go home with a, a wolf or a bear or a lion at the same time. Well, I, I'm going to call Robert out right now and tell you right now, there's no way Robert's going to put his deer tag on a wolf because he's going to have all the wolf tags available on every hunt he goes on. That's his first. He loads up on that more than snacks. <laughs> that is true. I, I, I do. I will have a bear tag and I will have a couple wolf tags. If I did run out of wolf tags, yep, I, that's would, fair. I would put my deer tag on a wolf. Same. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. I really think, you know, just across the board and cause I, I do that very, very similar thing too, is when I'm, when I'm in a state and I'm hunting, I will, I'll look at a lot of those predator tags and all of those just add-ons you can get when you already have the license, even, you know, stuff like even Upland game or, you know, this, that, and the other, I always look at everything I'm able to hunt with my license, the price of additional tags, whether that's a mountain lion tag in Arizona for 75 bucks or, uh, you know, bear tags in Idaho or Montana, wolf tags, uh, you know, any sort of little add on stuff that can just add to your hunt, give you a little more enjoyment. And especially on those days when you're not seeing crap, give you a chance to maybe plug something and make yourself feel a little bit better. Uh, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a great opportunity. I've been on a lot of, a lot of hunts where we were just having a day. We weren't really seeing anything and, and we saw it, a whole bunch of quail going into the, going into the brush. And so grabbed our shotguns out of the back of the truck. And we suddenly were on a quail hunt instead of a, instead of a deer hunt. Yep. So there's a, I think that's a, a really good point. It's just, there's a lot of all it don't, don't be so focused that you, you don't take a few minutes to like look around and see what other opportunities present themselves when you're in these draws, when you're in uh, when you're on these websites, you know, buying tags, things like that. Yeah, no good points. And, you know, Robert touched on schedule right out of the gate, you know, because as he takes those, those calls that come in, that's, that is one of those first questions. And one thing that's important to note about deer, if you, if you look across the West and these tags aren't, you know, some are readily available, some are less readily available and tougher to draw, but you can start hunting deer as early as like the last week of, or the first week of August. Um, you know, and I'm, again, I'm assuming that you, you're, we're talking about archery, muzzleloader and rifle, like all weapons on the table, but you can start hunting as early as August, real early in August, all the way through and uh, into January down in, in Arizona. Um, so, you know, there's almost always an opportunity to fill a chunk of your schedule with a deer hunt. If you're kind of planning ahead and looking at those opportunities. And I mean, I know we weren't really going to touch it. We discussed, we weren't really going to touch on this, but I mean, you can go as early as July if you really want to brave going to California. I uh, thought that was your rule. We weren't going to touch on that. <laughs> yeah. Now here you're breaking your own I'm rule. I'm breaking my own rule. Um, <laughs> I mean, we have mule deer in California too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, oh, those, true, though. those A units in California, I yep. mean, you can be hunting half of the stinking year if you're if you really, really want to. You can be hunting 
good majority of the year on on deer and i think that's why it's such an an awesome opportunity uh and and also a good a good hunt for new people to start getting into yeah for sure so we have montana uh what are uh what are some other good options where do people want to be putting in as well if they kind of want to get some of those premium hunts if you switch over to premium, I mean, to finish out some of the easier to draw general tags, like we talked about Idaho and Montana, Idaho, you can buy, they also have a draw. Montana is fairly easy to get, you know, Wyoming, if you stay away from, you know, some of the limited entry units and they have uh, regions and a lot of the regions, you know, especially not the stuff up against the Idaho border can be drawn with one or two points. Um, so you can kind of get a tag there every couple of years where you can get on a rotation where you're hunting Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming on a regular basis. Um, Colorado has, you know, great deer, but they have all kinds of season days from archery, muzzleloader, you know, up to three rifle hunts, you know, stuff on the plains has even later hunts. And it's a true preference point system there. So whoever has the most points gets the tags. But there's a lot of units a guy can draw with zero to one points, you know, especially if you look at muzzleloader and archery. You know, so that's a state that you can kind of, you know, combo in. Like I try to hunt Colorado every single year. I think I've missed one or two years in the last 10 years. And it's one of my favorite states to hunt. So those are ones that you can do on, a, say, a fairly regular basis, those four states. When you start looking at like Nevada and Arizona, those are, you know, more limited entry draw tags. Even the the tags that are kind of less desirable in, you know, some of those areas, and this is for rifle, you know, they can be a little bit tougher to draw. Arizona does have some over-the-counter archery stuff that's going on, you know, this time of year after, you know, December and January. But when you look at rifle tags, there's it's very well managed. There's not a lot of deer. The desert doesn't support as many deer as say some of the lush forests in Colorado or Idaho. And there's just more hunters that want to hunt their higher population. So you struggle to get tags. But when you do get a tag in, say, Nevada, Arizona, one of Utah's limited entry areas, you know, you're typically going to be hunting some some quality animals. The same can be said for like New Mexico, you know, anywhere around the Hickorya. You know, those units can produce some really, really good bucks. Um, so those are more what I think of like my trophy type stuff. Like you can draw a line from California, Nevada, Utah and go north for the most part that's going to be my opportunity yes there are some great units general stuff and colorado kind of fits in both models and then everything south of there you know nevada utah arizona new mexico that's kind of more of what i think about those are going to be the ones where i'm swinging for the fence a little bit more and trying to get those you know higher end tags and you you mentioned it and what i i, I gotta say like I know Jared, you're about to go hunt this tag and, uh, I've hunted it several years. Actually, you know, this deer right here, uh, you know, the listeners can't see me pointing. That's my very first deer I got on the over the counter archery tag in Arizona. Right on. And I honestly, like that is hands down probably. And I've probably said it a million times on this podcast is one of my favorite tags because it's over the counter if you're a put already putting in for Arizona, you are, you've already paid for the bulk, uh, you know, the, the license, the, all of those fees are already out of the way. And it's a tag that you can effectively hunt a, a good majority of the state for three seasons out of the year. You got, you got the late rut in January, you got uh, early season velvet in August, and then you've got the early rut in December. And I mean, that's some awesome opportunity right there for like, what, 350 bucks or something. I'm not sure what it costs this year, but I mean, that's a lot of hunting and it, I mean, it definitely limits. You don't want to buy that if you drew, if you're drawing, planning on drawing a tag this year in Arizona, uh, cause you are limited to that one deer, but I love that tag. And if you're an archery hunter and you're putting in for Arizona, you've got to be absolutely crazy to not pick up that tag. Yeah, and you can add a you can add a little colored peccary to the mix, a little javelina too, fairly easily. <laughs> yeah, and I I've never hunted those either, so I'm getting ready to to try on two new things here. Uh, I'm leaving this Saturday, so I'm super stoked about it. But yeah, it's it's a great time to get away from cold weather up north and get down to your shirt sleeves and get some cactus in your knees. <laughs> uh, between Arizona and Texas, I think I'm still picking out cactus three years later out of my camo, but. <laughs> I, you know, it's again, like, yeah, there's so much you can add on to that. The we've hunted dove, uh, 
dove mule deer and the the javelina the collared peccary all at once on that hunt and we've filled tags on all three of them on the same hunt and it's been amazing in addition we uh we saw a mountain lion didn't quite get a shot on it but we saw one and we were scrambling to get the rifle out i'll tell you what awesome yeah i echo robert across the board as far as like trophy picks versus opportunity picks um not really a surprise. It's, you know, that's pretty self-evident when you just look at how easy it is to acquire a tag. Um, you know, one thing I know Robert would agree with uh, when it comes to Colorado, if you're just getting into the points game, you don't want to get into thinking that somewhere down the road, you're going to draw one of those top half dozen or, you know, 10 units or so, or really, really quality third, four season rifle stuff, because it, it's a preference point draw for the deer. And if you don't have enough points, like, like we discussed in one of the earliest podcasts, you're just not in the draw at all, honestly. And most of Colorado's tags can be drawn with six points or less. And so it's not really worth getting into a real long-term strategy there. And some great deer can be killed on, on those fairly low point units. So that's the only thing I would definitely urge is to not jump in and start. And I'm Robert's going to laugh at me right now. Cause I think I have like 17 deer points in Colorado, you know, I'm in <laughs> no man's land exactly where I'm telling people not to get to. Um, but I'm telling you from experience, do as I say, not as I do. Um, having said that, you know, going back to points, Robert touched on Wyoming, any place that points are cheap, I can't help but encourage people who are starting to think about it to go ahead and acquire points. And Wyoming is an easy one to get. You know, you're just a little over 40 bucks a year for a deer point. It's probably worth building a few. Um, again, Robert did say this as well. Don't get crazy and think that you need to get try to chase max points for deer. That's not a real thing. But get a handful of points and guarantee yourself a tag down the road for 40 bucks a year. It's a good investment. One place I tell people typically not to, and Robert and I might disagree on this, is Montana is only like 25 bucks a year to build deer points, but they're limited entry hunts. There's a, a, a handful that are phenomenal hunts, like world class, but they issue so few tags that it's almost not really worth the way Montana conducts the deer draw to actually build deer points for bonus points in Montana. Now, what Robert was talking about earlier are preference points for those big game combo licenses. You do want to try to get those. If you're going to get a deer tag, you're going to have to try to get your a couple preference points to draw the combo license. But the special limited entry tag that's managed on bonus points, I typically don't encourage people to go chasing points on deer in Montana, even though it's a super good value. What do you think, Robert? No, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, the bonus point system is is very mature i mean it's it's you know almost going on two decades now so when you start squaring guys points and you're a non-resident you know yes the year you're applying you know give them the extra couple bucks and throw in for a limited entry draw and hope you get it um and that can almost kind of be said on the same with the elk you know uh other than like the archery for elk you know i recommend guys build points there because most better ones you can draw with you know around five points or less even the rifle elk, you start kind of getting into the same no man's as the deer. There's just not a lot of trophy units. The state manages more for opportunity than trophy. So when you do that, you're focusing everyone on those same handful of trophy units. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, one other thing on Colorado, you know, we talked about deer points and, you know, there's areas you can draw every year in Colorado. There's areas you can draw second choice and still gain points. Um, Colorado has multiple ways to get tags, you know, landowner tags are another way. Logan Hedges runs our landowner tag program here and he works with hundreds of outfitters to help get our guys tags. Those are tags you buy directly from the landowner and it allows you to hunt that unit. It could be a unit wide tag or it could be a ranch only tag, which means you can hunt any private land that you can get access on. Those tags, you know, are fair market value. Better units cost more, cheaper units don't. Um, I've picked up some pretty decent tags over the years, like off Craigslist for four or five hundred bucks. Then you still have to pay the state a little over three hundred dollars for your tag, but it's a way to go around the point system to guarantee yourself a tag. And then there's also turn back tags. And uh, turn back tags are a way that, like, let's just say Jared this year finally spent his uh, 472 deer points on a tag and then got scared and decided, <laughs> I don't want to hunt this. I, I need one more point and turns his tag back in, you know, 30 days before the season. Well, now that tag, depending on how many points it took, will either be reissued or it'll go up for just anyone and it'll be posted to their website. Yep. And, uh, you know, like last year, I 
didn't have any points because I drew in 2019. And so I was trying to pick up a landowner tag or a turn back tag. And uh, these are, you know, get turned back all the way through hunting season. So um, Austin, who works in the office with us, I gave him my credit card. And, uh, you know, I said, hey, I'm going to be gone, you know, for this extended period of time. If you see any of these tags look cool, buy them. And I got an in-reach message from him in Alaska. And I said, hey, dude, hope you're not mad, but I bought you a unit 18 tag. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was it was a tag that, you know, is one you can typically draw as a second choice. And I had a tag that cost me a little over 300 bucks and got to go to Colorado, found him a turn buck and put my tag on him. So there's lots of different ways in Colorado to work the system to get tags. The one thing that it doesn't offer is point sharing. You know, even though Jared's got almost a million deer points, I can't (laughs) use those um, because if I put in with zero and he put in with that, we'd equal zero. Or like a state like Nevada or Montana or other states, we could point share. Uh, Colorado does not allow that. It's a true Mm. preference point state. Yep. No, excellent points. So what would you put together for someone as, you know, that wants to build points in a few states, like we said, to draw some premium units, but also it's like, I want to hunt mule deer like once or twice a year uh, as well. Like maybe in two different spots, what would be the plan? Kind of like what we talked about with sheep, like your, your top States that, that you'd put together for yourself for like a, for mule deer. Well, for, for me, so Colorado's hands down the number one for mule deer across the board. Again, points aren't that expensive. You're going to be into point building strategy about a hundred bucks a year to start with deer. If you add elk and sheep, you're at like $119. I'm talking desert sheep, not Rocky mountain sheep. So just to be clear. So Colorado's number one, regardless of weapon choice. Now for me as an archery guy, Nevada is my number two, just because there's so much opportunity for, they've got a lot of deer tags, a lot of great quality uh, deer hunts available to archery hunters and great gun tags too. But to Robert's point, the draws are a lot tougher for some of the better ones for, for uh, gun. Uh, so I'm Colorado number one, regardless of weapon, Nevada number two, because I'm a bow hunter, Arizona definitely has to be in there. Cause I, there's so many species that I'm chasing in there anyway, plus the over the counter hunts that you just mentioned. And then, um, those would be my top three personally, the one that's on the bubble. Well, no. And then Wyoming, I already mentioned that that's a no brainer. You got to build points there. Cause it's 40 bucks a year, get a few points, make sure you're guaranteed a tag. Uh, but then the one that's on the bubble is Utah when it comes to deer. If you're just chasing limited entry in Utah, it's almost like Montana where there's a handful of units that it's just so hard to get that it's maybe not even worth trying to get in the lottery for them. But they do have a different category deer tag called the general deer. Um, I don't know why they call it general because there's nothing general about it. Residents and non-residents have to draw it. It's a preference point draw. So you get enough points, you're guaranteed the tag. And for a handful of points, you can draw some quality units that are producing really big bucks um, with uh, different weapon options as well. You know, you can apply for archery or muzzleload or a rifle. So Utah's a bubble state. If you're really a passionate deer hunter and you want to hunt them as often as possible, you probably ought to add Utah and be building preference points for that general category. So then are you thinking like, okay, you can hunt, hunt archery every single year, no problem in Arizona with that over the counter tag. If you're putting in every, you know, build a couple points in Montana, Wyoming. So you're drawn, you know, maybe every other year also in one of those States in a, in a slightly better unit. And then maybe Arizona and Nevada, where you're also building those points, you you get those, those bigger hunts after, after several years. And then Colorado as well. Yeah. Well, like Robert said, Colorado straddles that line. It's an every year state if you want it to be, or you can, you know, build up to four, five, six points and take the best tag available to you with your weapon choice and season dates that you're after. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, and, and also one thing to note, as, as I was saying that, it made uh, made me think that over-the-counter tag, the other cool thing is that does not affect your points at all in Arizona. That over-the-counter archery tag uh, doesn't touch your points. You can be building all your points in the draw, and that OTC tag, uh, you can still buy that while you're, while you're building points. You're still only allowed to take one deer a year in Arizona, whether you draw or not, but uh, that does not affect your points. So it's a good good opportunity to build and hunt every year. 
Yeah. A cool thing about Arizona too is let's just say in 2020 you didn't fill your deer tag, and in 2021 you know you weren't maybe necessarily thinking you're going to win the draw. I know a lot of guys will go down on Christmas. They'll kill a buck on their 2020 tag, and then they'll buy another tag and kill one after January 1st on their 2021 tag. So they'll kill two bucks in one trip, and then they won't apply. They'll just do points only in the draw for that year in 2021. It's a good opportunity. Again, make the most of your money, make the most of your trip. Yep. Um, I mean, you are effectively hunting on the same license that year. You're, I mean, because the Arizona licenses are year from purchase they're not calendar year if i remember correctly and so you're wise if you're wise with how you do it you can get all that done on a single license one in one year yeah you still have to buy the two deer tags but you do it on a single hunting license so yeah it's a great value my choices are really similar to jared's you know i'm gonna go colorado as my number one state just because the opportunity because of the genetics because the different seasons because I know I can force a tag and when I can force a tag, um, you know, Nevada is going to be my, my second one. I was born and raised there. I absolutely love that. You can put in for five choices. I can mix and match and do some August archery, September muzzleloader or October to early November rifle. So that's always going to be kind of my two top states. Um, you know, when I'm thinking of a third state, you know, this is where I kind of get a little bit more of a gray area. Like mm. I'm a big fan of Idaho on their limited entry tags. Um, you know, there's no points. Everyone's equal. If you draw, you got to sit out a year. My biggest year ever came from Idaho on an archery tag in August. And there's some, you know, actually pretty decent odds. So if a guy's not willing to chase the sheep or the goats, he wants to go deer, elk, and antelope. And I've done that a lot and I've pulled a handful of tags in there. So Idaho is kind of on the bubble for me. Um, and then, you know, same with Wyoming, you know, you can get a couple points, you know, two, three points and you're hunting, you know, region H on the Idaho border high country. It's got some good bucks or you can go out into the Northeast corner of the state. And, you know, there's some actually decent desert bucks out there. A guy can hunt on a regular basis. Um, I love Montana. Uh, I'm a resident there. I think the more time you put in, you know, the better opportunities you have for deer, you know, since the die off in Eastern Montana, 10, 11, I think it's, we're at a peak right now. It's, it's as good as I've seen it since the die off. And, uh, you know, I'm honestly going to probably put in more time this year hunting the the breaks in the country out there. Cause there's a lot of, you know, five to six year old bucks that yes, they don't have the best genetics, but still 160, 170. Um, you know, Arizona is my long shot. I'm sitting on two decades worth of points there. You know, I'm holding out for something super special, New Mexico. I'm putting in for the stuff around the Hickorya, um, Utah, you know, it was on Jared's bubble. That might be one. If you're not applying for other species, I don't know if I would get started in Utah. Yes. On the general tags, you can pull one typically every three years, but those hunts typically have more hunting pressure than say a Wyoming or an Idaho or a Montana area. And I just don't know if I'd want to, you know, play with the orange army. So (laughs) I might cross Utah off um, if I wasn't doing the other species there. If you are, you're crazy not to do deer and elk in any state, you're already buying a license, but uh, Utah would kind of be a bubble state for me. Uh, Oregon was always a great state for me. Uh, we could go and hunt Eastern uh, Oregon for archery over the counter deer. They did away with that this year. So it's all on a draw now. So now I'm sitting on two decades worth of points and can't go and over the counter hunt deer there. Um, <laughs> Washington and California. I don't really even waste my time there when it comes to deer. So yeah, I, I think Colorado and it could be going down. I mean, Colorado things are changing. The season dates rolled back this year tremendously. They're opening on the 13th. Last year, they closed on the 13th, like for just the third season. Um, You know, that's a big seven-day swing, you know, for hunting deer during the rut. You know, their CWD population was increasing. Their biologists felt like if we kill more of these older age class bucks, we can get it under control. So they're increasing tags later seasons. So I think your age class is going to start to take a little bit of a nosedive in Colorado. But with the genetics, the habitat, you know, and even on late dates, if you don't have snow, those deer are going to make it. So, I mean, Colorado definitely is is not what it was 10 years ago, but there's still some great bucks there. And still our number one for both of us, you know. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Still a hands-down leader in that regard. But, yeah, it isn't a pretty picture looking forward, unfortunately. Interesting. And it, it's funny. That's like the one – Colorado and Utah are like the uh, – 
as far as these states over here, really, I haven't put in. And I honestly, I couldn't tell you why I haven't been putting in for Colorado. Um, I have no idea. I think you have, I can tell you it's because you haven't been reading your hunt in full. <laughs> there we go. That's pretty uh, much it. <laughs> yeah, well, you would definitely get some pressure to, to be doing it if if you were religiously studying the hunting fool. Well, I'm damn sure going to start now. I feel like <laughs> I call you out. You guys make me feel bad about myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I and you know this is I'm sitting there going through this and I'm I'm looking at my hunt plan for this year. And clearly, I'm definitely going to be hunting Montana quite a bit this year uh for for mule deer and elk and everything else i can possibly get my hands on and i've built a few points in wyoming and i'm going down for pronghorn so you know deer may be may also be in my future for wyoming this year Uh, i'm not i may just pick up and spur the moment drive down to arizona and go hunt uh hunt january down there but right now i've just got so much going on i keep talking myself out of it and i shouldn't i need to I need to just pack up and go down there. And I got some buddies that always hunt, uh, that always hunt down there every year, chase uh, javelina and muleys. So I might have to hit them up and tell them I'm going to crash the party, tag along with them because they have the good glass too. (laughs) They've got the real nice glass. They've got, they've, they got the sponsor glass. Uh, (laughs) But uh, so is there anything else um, we need to make sure we touch on with muley? I don't think so. I, I would agree with Robert. I do like the the draw process for deer in Idaho. Just, you know, just to reaffirm that, because that's one I didn't mention as well. Um, I particularly, I like it because Idaho has quite a handful of traditional muzzleloader seasons. You got to kind of use an old fashioned smoke pole, like the good old days. And some of those tags, you know, they're typically rut dates or better dates and they can be a ton of fun and they're pretty easy for non-residents to draw. So it is something to look at, uh, multiple limited entry weapon choices in Idaho with good draw odds or at least reasonable draw odds because there is no point system. So I like that idea too. Awesome guys. Well, thank you so much. Really. This was, this was a super informative one for me and it probably the one that's changing my strategy the most so far about like how I've been putting in and where I've been putting in. I'm four years behind now. Dang it. Uh, <laughs> So uh, thank you again so much. Uh, reminder to everyone listening, make sure to head over to Hunt and Fool. Use code TWI60 to get your 60-day free trial to use and abuse the service while you're putting in for your tags and ma- putting together your application strategy. 60-day um, digital membership for free. And also make sure to use the hunt, those check out those hunt calculator tools, check the draw dates, print those suckers out, keep referencing them. Uh, it's all on the hunt and fool website. Uh, you do not want to do what I do and realize at about five o'clock in the evening that it's your last day to draw uh, <laughs> and start your research. Then you're, you're going to be sad. <laughs> um, so check out those draw dates, but guys, thank you again so much for uh, hopping online. Oh, thanks for having us. Yep. Thanks, Sam. All right, y'all. That'll do it for this episode of The Wild Initiative. Make sure to check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com. Get links to everything we talked about in today's episode. Y'all, I want to say a big thank you to both Jared and Robert for hopping on the podcast and sharing all of this super valuable information with y'all. Hope y'all were taking notes. Make sure, again, I can't harp on this enough. There's no reason for you not to head on over to huntandfool.com, the Hunt and Fool website, sign up for a digital membership using that TWI60 code. Gets you 60 free days, y'all. This will get you through all your application planning, all of that stuff. See what is so valuable about the service. And again, check out those free tools on the website. Uh, make sure you check out that list of draw dates and check out that hunt cost calculator to see what you're going to be paying out of pocket. All right, y'all, that'll do it for this week. Looking forward to next time. But until then, I hope this podcast inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more. 